our second reading, Matthew chapter 14, 22 through 33. It's going to start with immediately, and the context here is immediately after the feeding of the 5,000 and the miracle of feeding of the 5,000. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from the land and the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus said, lost my place. Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him and saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may remember this story when you were young. You probably saw it on a flannel board in Sunday school class, maybe. And you were then really going to take this story pretty literally. Jesus appearing to his disciples who are in a boat in a storm-tossed sea. But if you stay there, you miss that it is full of symbolism reflecting the situation of the post-Easter church, both then and now. The time of writing the Gospel of Matthew, scholars would say, was likely around the window of year 75 to 100 AD, so 75 to 100 years after his death. This post-Easter time was a time of great trauma for the early church. The small minority group of mainly Jewish convert Christians were no longer welcomed in the synagogues. They were kicked out of the synagogues. You also need to know that the temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed in the year 87, so the Jewish faith itself was being attacked, and even Jewish people questioned God's commitment to them. Picture then the Christians as an outcast group being marginalized and threatened. That was who was Matthew's original audience he was writing to. Yes, we can add a lot to the potential meaning of this story if we look at it from this post-Easter early church perspective. First off, note Jesus is not physically staying with his followers. This is not by their choice. The reading says he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead towards the other side. And then he personally dismissed the crowd. There he is alone by his choice. What does he do in his aloneness? Leaving this, he went up the mountain by himself to pray, leaving the disciples at sea in their boat by themselves. Up the mountain, Jesus goes. We've talked about mountains before and how important they are, and there were lots of important things where they are where important things happen. In this case, the mountaintop is not a, a place of teaching as the example was with Moses, but is now a site of communion with God in prayer. This emphasizes the perceived physical separation of the people from God. 
this, the result of this arrangement is the community feels himself below while Jesus exists apart above in the presence of God. Can you visualize how the early church would see itself in this way, separated from God? This is the fate of the church in every age, including ours, to see God above and we below. In this story, it actually gets worse. We are adrift in the sea while God is on the mountain. Indeed, we believe the Lord is alive, that he is risen and therefore is not mundanely accessible as we might like, not available just to reach out and touch like teaching, touching another one of the disciples, or like when he spent time on earth. So again, one of the first things we note in this story is that Jesus is not physically staying with his followers. In Moses-like fashion, Jesus proves that he is both the leader of the disciples, sends them out in a boat, and the crowds, sends them home, even as he physically separates himself from them. And he is still the intercessor with the divine. He is the one who climbs the mountain alone for his rendezvous with the Father. Now, next in the story, we have already noted the disciples are all together in this same boat out in the stormy sea. This symbolizes a metaphor that captures the church's collective identity and shared fate. Whether you want to say they're in the same boat or if you're a land person or in the same bus, we can relate. We are there together. The focus of the story is on being separated from the Lord and weathering the storm together, but on our own. The storm of life is a hostile environment. But back to the original story. Things are not going well on the lake crossing. First, they are far from land, too far to easily just turn back from their present course. They are committed to see this through or perhaps perish. Does that allow doubt to creep in? Certainly, they are human. Second, our trans NRSV translation does not do the sea conditions justice when it says battered by the waves. This you might think of as being over here on the reservoir and the wind comes up and you're battered a little bit. If you much, a much richer picture is as the word describes trials of human condition is in the midst, is in other translations. They are huddled in this crowded, inanimate boat. Other translations would say they would be tortured or tormented. Gives us a richer picture of what's happening to them in this boat. This can certainly resonate with our contemporary struggles against the headwinds that resist the life of faith in what Charles Taylor rightly calls or labels a secular age that we are in. In short, in the interpretation of this story, both in Matthew's time and ours, the boat on the stormy tossed seas is the church in the world at risk and assailed by the forces of chaos. Assailed for reasons beyond the community's control and most often through no fault of their own. The situation is, can certainly be perceived as dire. But the story does not end there. This is just the setup for the real story to continue for the real main event. When a storm arises while the disciples are on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus comes down from the mountain and goes out to meet the disciples where they are. The verse says, and early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. He was walking in or on the raging sea. It's not clear why Jesus feels compelled to travel across the raging sea. You may recall that not long before this, he had calmed the raging sea with no more than a word. Why not the same again? 
Well, perhaps we are to accept that this walk is another way of demonstrating God's dominion over the sea. Demonstrate Jesus' authority over the created order. But his presence to the disciples is not familiar or immediately comforting. His immunity to the power of the sea is awesome to behold, but beyond anything they can comprehend. In their terror, they take him to be a ghost. Jesus' words to his troubled disciples underscore his divine identity. As he approaches the boat, he declares, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Now, commentaries tell us the common English translation, it is I, obscures the real Greek when it says, or uses the phrase, I am. The same thing God says to Moses at the burning bush to describe God's self, I am. If walking on water weren't enough to demonstrate his divine status, Matthew's Jesus repeats the very words of God, I am. When Jesus reassures the 12 that he is no ghost and encourages them to have courage, Peter alone embraces the risk of more fully experiencing the confusing presence of the Lord. He has not seen this before and may never see it again, Peter wants to take advantage of this opportunity. You might ask, is he wrong to leave the safety of the boat and seek something more of his own? Is he wrong to challenge the Lord and say, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water? The challenge most surely is grounded in at least a tentative trust Peter must think the Lord's command can command such a thing. It's surely possible. Jesus, still standing there in the storm, seems open to the idea and says, come. It starts out well. The walk ends when the wind distracts Peter's attention and he begins to sink. After a cry for help, he is saved from drowning, but not from what would seem to be a crucially crucial or critical debriefing in the boat. You of little faith, why did you doubt? So perhaps this experience gives us the answer to the question, do we stay in the boat? Stay in the boat, take Jesus' word for it, that he is Lord. Do not venture out in search of the extraordinary. Stay in the boat, that is the safest way to believe. Believe without getting wet or enduring humiliating public reprimand about not having enough faith. Then again, maybe not. Peter's story suggests that getting out of the boat, getting out even if it may seem to lead to failing in a spectacular, interesting, creative way, even if you might find yourself sinking into the sea, Peter, gets out of the boat. Jesus does not demand that anyone get out of the boat. He seems to be as interested as anyone else to see how this venture will end. Even in what might be perceived as failure, it does not end in the drowning, but in rescue. Jesus is there and reaching out. Then the ultimate ending is grace that swallows up doubt and inspires worship even in those who are watching from the safety of the boat. With this approach to interpreting the story, the scold about little faith loses its edge. We hear in that a good-natured ribbing of one who knows that when it comes to the paradox of faith, the little faith can go a long way. After all, he walked on water. With this interpretation, Christian faith is not about the certitude and the safety of believing from the boat, but rather faith is about probing the productive tension between doubt and trust that leads us into action, leads us ever deeper into mysterious relationship with the Lord, a faith that may give us the courage 
to walk on water. We have a Lord who comes to us in the darkness and the storm. A Lord who is present to us, most obviously, just when we risk something and begin to sink. His hand reaches out. Noted German theologian of the World War II era, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, whose testimony is, is more compelling because of the real risks he took for faith, summarizes this interpretation in a well-known passage from his book, The Cost of Discipleship. Bonhoeffer says, Peter had to leave the ship and risk his life on the sea in order to learn both his own weakness and the almighty power of the Lord. If Peter has not taken the risk, he would never have learned the meaning of faith. Peter left the safety of the boat and his faith was rewarded by the hand up from God. Are you ready like Peter to leave the safety of the boat? May it be so. Amen.